Black opals are among the most captivating, gorgeous and rare gemstones in the world. Known for their mesmerizing play of color against a deep dark background, unlike common opals, black opals possess a striking contrast between vibrant hues of blue, green, red and orange that shimmer against their dark body tone, making each one truly unique. These opals form under specific geological conditions, primarily in the Lightning Ridge region of Australia in New South Wales, where ancient volcanic ash and silica-rich groundwater interacted over millions of years. What makes black opals so rare is their complex formation process and a limited number of deposits that produce gem-quality stones. Their rarity and beauty have made them some of the most sought-after gems, prized by collectors and jewelers around the world. Lightning Ridge is the only place in Australia and the world that consistently produces world-class black opals. While opals are mined in other parts of Australia, like Coober Pedy and Andamooka, these regions primarily yield white and crystal opals. The unique geological conditions at Lightning Ridge, including its silica-rich groundwater and specific Cretaceous sedimentary layers, create the perfect environment for forming high-quality black opals. This makes Lightning Ridge the unrivaled source of the most valuable and brilliant black opals, a rarity found nowhere else on Earth. Opals, including the famed black opals from Lightning Ridge, form through a delicate and unique geological process. The formation of opals requires specific environmental conditions, primarily involving the movement of silica-rich water through porous sedimentary rocks. Opal is composed of tiny silica spheres arranged in a grid-like structure which scatter light and create the famous play of colour that makes precious opals so valuable. This optical phenomenon occurs when white light is diffracted by the arrangement of the silica spheres. The formation of black opals, such as those found in Lightning Ridge, is particularly rare. These opals are formed in sedimentary environments, often at the base of ancient freshwater channels. The critical aspect of black opal formation is the presence of iron-rich sediment, which gives the opal its dark background colour. This dark backdrop enhances the contrast of the play of colour, making black opal one of the most sought after gems in the world. Opals can form from the skeletons of ancient dinosaurs through a unique process known as opalization. When a dinosaur skeleton is buried in sediment, groundwater rich in silica can seep into the bones over time. As the organic material of the bones decays, it leaves behind cavities and voids. The silica-rich water gradually fills these spaces, and under the right conditions, it solidifies into opal. This process can preserve the intricate structure of the original bone, replacing it with opal and creating what is known as an opalized fossil. In rare cases, the entire skeleton or fragments of a dinosaur can be opalized, leading to spectacular fossils that are not only scientifically valuable, but also beautiful and highly prized for their unique gemstone qualities. Lightning Ridge in Australia is famous for such discoveries, where opalized fossils of marine reptiles, early dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures have been unearthed. But not all gemstones found in Lightning Ridge are associated with animal remains. The majority of opals are not directly linked to fossils. The opals at Lightning Ridge formed primarily through the movement of silica-rich groundwater through sedimentary rocks, which led to the deposition of opals in voids, cracks and porous rock layers. Most of the opals found are formed as nodules, known as nobbies, or in seams within the claystone or sandstone layers without any direct connection to organic material. Although fossilized remains opalized with the silica-rich water are fascinating and a rare occurrence, most of the opals mined at Lightning Ridge are purely geological in origin, not tied to ancient animal remains. The geology of Lightning Ridge is characterized by sedimentary layers from the Great Artesian Basin, which formed during the Cretaceous period. The Grimmon Creek Formation, which lies beneath Lightning Ridge, is where most of the opal deposits are found. This formation consists of claystone, sandstone and mudstone, which are deposited in ancient rivers and lakes. Over time, silica-rich water percolated through these sediments, leading to the formation of opal within the pores of the rock. The volcanic ash is believed to have played a significant role in the opalization process, providing the necessary silica for opal formation. As groundwater moved through the ash layers, it dissolved the silica and carried it into the surrounding sediments, where it eventually precipitated to form opal. The volcanic materials that contributed to opal formation at Lightning Ridge were intermediate to felsic in composition, characterized by higher silica content. These volcanic deposits, such as ash and tuff, 
would have originated from distant explosive volcanic events, producing large quantities of fine volcanic ash that settled over vast areas, including the sedimentary basins of Lightning Ridge. Falsic and intermediate volcanic rocks such as rhyolite, dacite and andesite are rich in silica, which is essential for opal formation. The silica from these volcanic materials was later dissolved by groundwater and transported into the surrounding sedimentary environment, where it precipitated and eventually formed opals. The presence of these volcanic materials in the Cretaceous sediments of the Great Artesian Basin supports the idea that the volcanism responsible for the silica was explosive, possibly from caldera forming eruptions or large stratovolcanoes. At the time, Australia was located on the eastern margin of the supercontinent Gondwana, and volcanic arcs were present further east, along the edge of where Australia meets the Pacific Ocean. This was before the formation of the Tasman Sea, and these volcanic arcs were part of a long-lived subduction zone, where the Pacific Oceanic Plate was being subducted beneath the eastern margin of Gondwana. The volcanic arcs associated with this subduction zone are located along what is now the eastern highlands of Australia. Another crucial factor in the formation of opals at Lightning Ridge is the region's unique hydrological conditions. The Great Artesian Basin, one of the largest aquifers in the world, provided a steady flow of groundwater, which was essential for opal formation. The groundwater, enriched with dissolved silica, moved through the porous sediments of the Grimmon Creek Formation, depositing silica in the form of opal. Over millions of years, this process created the opal deposits that are mined today. At various times during the Cretaceous, parts of the Great Artesian Basin were submerged by shallow, brackish or freshwater bodies, resembling an inland sea or shallow estuarine environment. This shallow sea was the result of high sea levels during the Cretaceous, which allowed marine transgressions to flood large areas of what is now central and eastern Australia. These marine incursions led to the deposition of fine-grained sediments like claystones and siltstones, which are now part of the Grimmon Creek Formation a key opal-bearing unit. The depth of these waters would have been relatively shallow, likely on the order of tens of metres at most, with varying depths depending on local conditions. The water would have fluctuated between shallow marine, estuarine and freshwater environments, depending on sea level changes, tectonic activity and climatic factors. The mix of environments allowed for the deposition of sediments that would later be transformed into opal-rich layers. Opals were first discovered in Lightning Ridge in the late 19th century, but it wasn't until the early 20th century that opal mining began in earnest. In 1903, the town of Lightning Ridge was surveyed, and hundreds of hand-dug shafts were sunk by miners in search of precious opals. Initially, the mining process was labour-intensive, with miners using pickaxes, shovels and wheelbarrows to extract opal-bearing dirt from the ground. The opals were often found in small nodules or seams within the sedimentary rock. Over time, the reputation of Lightning Ridge as a source of high-quality black opals grew, and miners from all over the world flocked to the area. By 1910, the town was a thriving opal mining community, with production reaching its peak in the early 20th century. Today, Lightning Ridge remains one of the most important opal mining regions in the world, producing a wide variety of opals, including black, crystal and white opals. Opal mining at Lightning Ridge has evolved significantly since the early days of hand-dug shafts and rudimentary tools. Today, most opal mining is done using mechanised equipment, although many small-scale miners still work the fields using traditional methods. The typical mining process involves sinking a vertical shaft through the sandstone and clay layers to reach the opal-bearing strata below. Once the opal dirt is reached, horizontal tunnels known as drives are dug to extract the precious opals. One of the challenges of opal mining is the irregular distribution of opal within the host rock. Miners often rely on drilling rigs to locate opal deposits before excavating the surrounding rock. Once the opal bearing layer is removed, it is processed using machines to break it down and reveal any opals hidden within. Despite the introduction of mechanised equipment, opal mining remains a labour-intensive and often unpredictable venture. Miners can spend years searching for opals without finding any significant deposits. However, the high value of black opals makes the potential rewards worth the effort for many miners. Opal mining is significantly more challenging than gold mining due to the unpredictable and scattered nature of the opal deposits. Unlike gold, which tends to settle in specific locations, such as in veins, reefs or placid deposits formed by water flow, opals can be found almost anywhere within the soil. Gold miners have the advantage of targeting known geological features, like quartz veins or riverbeds. 
where gold tends to concentrate due to its density. In contrast, opal miners must dig through layers of sediment with little certainty, as opals can form in small random pockets or seams, often requiring extensive trial and error to locate even small amounts. The nature of opal distribution, which can occur in any part of the sandstone or claystone, makes it a far more labour intensive and less predictable venture. This randomness adds to the difficulty and risk, as miners may spend years searching without striking a valuable opal deposit. Lightning Ridge stands as a beacon in the world of opal mining, not only for its unique black opals, but also for its fascinating geological history. The interplay of sedimentary environments, volcanic activity, and groundwater flow has created the perfect conditions for the formation of opals over millions of years. From its early days as a small mining settlement to its current status as the world's premier source of black opals, Lightning Ridge is truly a remarkable area that is filled with some of the most fascinating and beautiful gemstones on our planet. I hope you enjoyed this topic as much as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Beneath the remote Kimberley region of Australia, a discovery was made that would challenge everything geologists thought they knew about diamonds. The Argyle Mine unearthed not only some of the world's rarest pink diamonds, but also revealed these treasures in an unexpected host rock. Lamproite, a volcanic rock long dismissed in diamond exploration. This revelation expanded the boundaries of geological theory, forcing experts to reconsider how and where diamonds could form. Argyle didn't just produce diamonds, it redefined the future of diamond mining, introducing a new frontier of exploration and igniting a global demand for its stunning coloured gems. This is the story of how Argyle transformed an entire industry. The Argyle Diamond Mine, located in the East Kimberley region of Western Australia, is renowned worldwide for its production of some of the rarest and most valuable diamonds, particularly its iconic pink diamonds. Since its discovery in the late 1970s, Argyle has transformed our understanding of diamond geology, challenged prevailing theories about diamond formation, and introduced new mining techniques to the industry. Though the mine ceased its open pit operations in 2020, its geological significance, economic contributions, and the uniqueness of the diamonds it produced continue to resonate throughout the diamond industry and beyond. This video explores the geology, significance, formation, and mining of Argyle diamonds, focusing on what made the mine a global phenomenon. The Argyle diamond deposit is geologically unique, particularly because its diamonds are hosted in lamproite a volcanic rock rarely associated with diamond deposits. Traditionally, kimberlite, another ultramafic volcanic rock, was considered the primary host for diamonds. Argyle challenged this conventional wisdom when diamonds were discovered in the AK-1 lamproite pipe in the late 1970s. The discovery not only expanded the geological model for diamond exploration, but also opened up new possibilities for discovering diamonds in similar volcanic environments around the world. The Argyle Lamproite Pipe formed roughly 1.2 billion years ago, during the Proterozoic Aeon. This volcanic pipe or diatreme is a rare type of volcanic eruption that are incredibly fast and violent, with magma rising from deep within the Earth's mantle at speeds of several hundred kilometers per hour. Unlike typical volcanic eruptions, Lamproite and Kimberlite pipes are not associated with large magma chambers. Instead, they form from rapid bursts of gas-rich magma propelled directly from the mantle. The high concentration of volatile gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapour expands as the magma ascends, creating explosive forces that push the material to the surface in a matter of hours or even minutes. This swift and intense eruption process is what allows diamonds, which are formed at depths of over 150 kilometres, to be transported to the surface relatively intact. The resulting volcanic pipe or diatreme is filled with fragmented rock and diamond-bearing lamproite leaving behind a distinctive carrot-shaped structure in the Earth's crust. Geologically, the Argyle Pipe is situated in the Halls Creek Mobile Zone, a tectonic belt that separates the Kimberley Craton from the younger sedimentary basins surrounding it. The central Kimberley region, where the mine is located, consists of ancient, stable rock formations known as cratons, which are ideal environments for diamond formation. The presence of lamproite in this tectonically active area created the unique geological conditions that allowed the Argyle diamonds to be brought to the surface in a single explosive volcanic eruption, where they were deposited within the lamproite pipe. Diamonds form under extreme conditions, typically at depths of 150 to 200 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface, where temperatures range from 1000 to 1500 degrees Celsius 
and pressures exceed 45 kilobars. Argyle diamonds likely formed around 1.6 billion years ago, deep within the Earth's mantle. While most diamond deposits are hosted in kimberlite pipes, the presence of diamonds in Argyle's lamproite pipe was a revelation, indicating that lamproite could also serve as a diamond-bearing rock. The diamonds from Argyle are particularly notable for their range of colours, especially the rare pink diamonds. Unlike traditional diamonds whose coloration is typically influenced by impurities like nitrogen or boron, the pink hue in Argyle diamonds is thought to be caused by structural defects within the diamond lattice that lead to the selective absorption of light, giving the diamonds their signature colour. While scientists believe this is related to plastic deformation during the diamond's journey to the surface, which altered their crystal structure, the exact mechanism behind the pink coloration remains a topic of ongoing research. In addition to pink diamonds, Argyle also produced brown diamonds, which were heavily marketed as champagne or cognac diamonds. These brown diamonds make up the majority of Argyle's output and were crucial in making the mine economically viable. Their coloration is also linked to structural defects, similar to the process that creates pink diamonds. Although the specifics of brown coloration differ slightly in terms of the types of crystal deformations involved. Blue diamonds were also found at the Argyle diamond mine, though they were extremely rare. The primary focus of Argyle has always been its production of pink diamonds, but occasional blue diamonds have been discovered. These blue diamonds are prized for their rarity and beauty, similar to the pink diamonds, but their occurrence at Argyle was much less frequent. The blue coloration in diamonds typically results from the presence of boron within the crystal lattice, which causes the diamond to absorb red, yellow and green light, giving it a blue hue. The discovery of the Argyle diamond mine in 1979 came after nearly a decade of geological exploration in the remote Kimberley region of Western Australia. In the late 1960s, geologists began investigating the area based on geological similarities to known diamond-bearing regions in Southern Africa. The breakthrough came in 1979 when two diamond crystals were found in a sample of stream gravel from Smoke Creek, leading geologists upstream to the source, the AK-1 Lamproite pipe. This opened up new possibilities for diamond exploration and eventually led to the establishment of the Argyle Mine, which would become the world's largest producer of diamonds by volume. Mining at the Argyle Diamond Mine began with the extraction of alluvial diamonds found in the stream gravels of Smoke Creek, which had eroded from the AK-1 Lamproite pipe over millions of years. These alluvial deposits were the first economically viable source of diamonds discovered in the area, and initial mining operations focused on recovering diamonds from these loose surface level gravels. However, after a few years, attention shifted to the source of the alluvial diamonds, the AK-1 pipe itself. In 1983, the mine transitioned to hard rock mining, targeting the lamproite host rock through open pit methods. This marked a significant change, as the operation expanded to exploit the vast diamond reserves embedded within the lamproite, including Argyle's famed pink diamonds. Thus, while mining initially focused on easily accessible alluvial deposits, the discovery and development of the lamproite pipe became the cornerstone of Argyle's long-term success. The scale of the open pit operation was immense, with a pit measuring over 1,500 metres in length and 600 metres in width. To extract diamonds from lamproite, the ore had to be processed using a series of advanced mechanical and chemical methods. The mining process began with the drilling and blasting of the lamproite ore, which was then transported to a processing plant where it was crushed into smaller fragments. These fragments were scrubbed and screened to remove dust and debris. The next step involved using heavy media separation, a technique that takes advantage of the high density of diamonds to separate them from the less dense surrounding rock. The final stage of diamond recovery employed X-ray luminescent technology, which could detect the unique light-emitting properties of diamonds under X-rays and separate them from other minerals. Underground mining began in 2013, as the open pit operation reached its economical limits. This method allowed miners to access deeper sections of the lamproite pipe, extending the life of the mine until its closure in 2020. The discovery of the Argyle Diamond Mine in 1979 marked a significant milestone in both Australian mining and global diamond production. Prior to Argyle, Australia had no significant diamond mines, and the majority of the world's diamonds came from Africa and Russia. Argyle changed this by quickly becoming one of the world's largest diamond producer by volume. In its peak year of production, 1994, Argyle produced over 42 million carats of diamonds, accounting for approximately 40% of the world's diamond production. Argyle's significance extends beyond the sheer volume of diamonds it produced. The mine's pink diamonds are among the rarest and most valuable gemstones in the world, 
with prices reaching hundreds of thousands of dollars per carat. This rarity is due to the fact that less than 0.1% of Argyle's total diamond output consists of pink diamonds. Despite their scarcity, pink diamonds from Argyle command astronomical prices due to their desirability, making them a symbol of luxury and exclusivity. In addition to its commercial significance, Argyle has had a profound impact on diamond exploration and mining techniques. The discovery of diamonds in Lamperite prompted geologists to reevaluate potential diamond-bearing rock types worldwide, expanding the scope of diamond exploration. Argyle also set a new standard for large-scale diamond mining employing advanced ore processing techniques to handle the vast quantities of rock required to extract diamonds economically. Although the Argyle mine ceased operations in 2020, its legacy endures through the diamonds it produced and the geological discoveries it inspired. The mine's pink diamonds remain some of the most sought-after gemstones in the world, symbolizing luxury, rarity and beauty. Beyond its commercial success, Argyle expanded our understanding of diamond geology, proving that Lamperite, in addition to Kimberlite, could host economically viable diamond deposits. It also revolutionized diamond mining techniques, setting a standard for future operations around the world. The Argyle Diamond Mine represents more than just a source of valuable gemstones. It is a demonstration to the ingenuity of modern geology and mining, and a lasting symbol of Australia's mineral wealth. The Argyle Mine will continue to stand as a benchmark for scientific discovery, responsible mining, and a timeless allure of diamonds. I hope you found this topic as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Check this out. It looks like a diamond, doesn't it? But looks can be deceiving. This is the story of the so-called Killicranky Diamond, a gemstone found on Flinders Island, located in the Bass Strait between Tasmania and Victoria. These gems were among Australia's earliest gemstone exports in the early 1800s, and their high hardness and luster make them durable and visually appealing. And when faceted, they sparkle in a way reminiscent of diamonds. But spoiler alert, they aren't diamonds. The Killicranky Diamond is a form of brilliant white topaz, known for its exceptional clarity, high refractive index and hardness, which give it a sparkling diamond-like appearance. This topaz is often colourless and transparent, qualities that resemble those of true diamonds, leading early settlers and collectors to mistake it for the real thing. The topaz is primarily found on Flinders Island, concentrated at the northeastern end of Killicranky Bay on the island's northwestern coast. It also occurs commonly on nearby Mount Killicranky in offshore sediments and in Mines Creek and Tanners Bay, located approximately 10 kilometers to the south. Alongside this, the topaz also occurs on Cape Barren Island to the south of Flinders Island. Although these findings took on the name of Cape Barren Diamonds, these topaz deposits share the same geological origin as the ones found on Flinders Island, which we will discuss soon. Flinders Island is associated with tin mining activity, though most of the mining actually occurred on nearby Cape Barren Island. Both the tin and topaz found in the region originate from granite formations. The first export of topaz definitely occurred before tin mining began. The tin mineral cassiterite, found in association with the topaz, had not yet been identified at the time. Tin mining began around 1882, but the first discovery of Killicranky diamonds likely occurred as early as 1803, according to studies done on it. In 1851, a remarkable collection of Killicranky gemstones made its way from the remote shores of Flinders Island to the Grand Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, London. This display, part of a grand exhibition showcasing the treasures of the British Empire, included a variety of topaz crystals collected by Joseph Milligan and his team. While these gemstones had become known as Killicranky Diamonds due to their sparkling clarity, the exhibit revealed an array of colours beyond the classic clear or white stones. Among the 300 white topaz specimens, viewers marvelled at 40 yellow and 30 pink topaz crystals. Alongside the topaz, Milligan's team had gathered other gems, including 25 pieces of rock crystal and 30 beryls. All part of this fascinating display that showcased the mineral wealth of Australia's Flinders Island and drew admiration from audiences halfway across the world. To clarify, rock crystal is a term used for colourless transparent quartz, also more commonly known as quartz crystals. Beryl is also found on the island, and it is best known as the family of gemstones that include emerald, aquamarine, morganite and heliodor. Based on the source from Mineral Resources Tasmania, it appears that the beryl found on Flinders Island includes both colourless goshenite and bluish-green aquamarine varieties, though it is typically not gem quality. 
Now this topaz is associated with a few controversies dating back to at least the 1850s when an attempt was made to sell it off as diamonds in the UK. According to old articles from that time, attempts were made to sell off Cape Baron topaz as diamonds. The seller fully believed that they were diamonds, and even the London lapidary whom he sent specimens to be tested believed that they were quote diamonds but of no value. A second person was given the topaz specimens to test. He immediately said that they were not diamonds and were soft, but upon attempting to file it down, he was surprised by how hard the specimens were. He couldn't make up his mind on what these rocks were. The defendant was later acquitted due to the fact that no one could agree on what these gemstones actually were and it was decided that he wasn't attempting to scam people, but that he really believed that the topaz gems were in fact diamonds. Another controversy occurred in 1919, this time with Killer Cranky Diamonds. Unlike the 1850s, at this point in time, testing for gemstones had advanced to the extent that scientists could distinguish between crystal systems and identify minerals based on their crystal habit and symmetry. By analyzing characteristics like cleavage, hardness, and crystal shape, Gemologists were able to determine that the Killer Cranky Topaz exhibited an orthorhombic crystal system rather than an isometric or cubic crystal system typical of diamonds, which commonly display dodecahedral or octahedral habits. These visual and structural differences, along with the evolving field of X-ray crystallography, allowed experts to more accurately classify and authenticate gemstones, reducing the risk of misidentification. Alongside this, it was noted that none of the specimens scratched a diamond, a telltale sign of Topaz's lower hardness. While diamonds rank at 10 on the Moz scale, making them the hardest natural material, Topaz has a hardness of 8, which, although durable, is not sufficient to scratch a diamond. This hardness test provided a straightforward and effective method for confirming that the so-called Killer Cranky Diamonds were in fact Topaz, despite their similar appearance and sparkle. But this isn't all. By 1919, the geology of diamond fields had been more thoroughly established thanks to the African diamond rush in South Africa. Geologists knew that ultramafic rocks, specifically kimberlite, hosted diamonds, and that not a single trace of this rock existed in or around Flinders Island, which is composed of sediments and granites. So where did these beautiful topaz gemstones come from? Well, from the ancient magma that now exists as solidified granite on the island. Flinders Island hosts a variety of granite formations ranging from the Devonian to Carboniferous periods, spanning from 419 to 299 million years ago. It contains both S-type and I-type granites, with each contributing differently to the island's mineralogy and gem potential. To clarify the difference between I-type and S-type granites, I-type means igneous-type granites, while S-type means sedimentary-type granites. S-type granites, such as the Killercranky, Cape Franklin, Babel Island, Streslecki and Lady Baron granites contain aluminium-rich minerals due to their origin from the melting of sedimentary rocks like clay and shale. These granites are rich in minerals like muscovite, garnet and biotite, and the high aluminium content fosters the formation of gemstone quality minerals such as the topaz. In contrast, I-type granites including the Palana, Lagrada and Darling Range granites originate from the melting of igneous rocks with lower aluminium and higher calcium and sodium content. I-type granites are characterized by a different mix of minerals, often containing higher amounts of mafic minerals such as hornblende. Although both I-type and S-type granites can include biotite, the S-types are typically richer in aluminium. This higher aluminium content in S-type granites make them more conducive to forming aluminium-rich gemstones, like topaz. The difference between these two types is significant for the gem landscape of Flinders Island. While I-type granites add mineral diversity with common minerals like quartz and feldspar, the S-type granites provide the prized gem deposits that have made Flinders Island an attractive destination for gem collectors. The I-type and S-type granites on Flinders Island form through distinct geological processes, each resulting in unique mineral compositions and characteristics. I-type granites originated from the partial melting of mafic igneous rocks, likely in a subduction-related tectonic environment during the Devonian. This process involved the melting of basaltic or andesitic rocks, producing a magma rich in calcium, sodium, and iron, but lower in aluminium. As a result, I-type granites are typically a denser, darker appearance with fewer aluminium-rich minerals. I-type granites typically cool and crystallize at a moderate rate within the crust, which can limit the growth of large crystals compared to the slow-cooling pegmatitic pockets often found in S-type granites. While they can form pegmatites, I-type granite tends to contain standard rock-forming minerals such as feldspar, quartz, and biotite, 
rather than the rare or gem quality minerals commonly associated with S-type granites. In contrast, S-type granites on Flinders Island formed from the partial melting of aluminium rich sedimentary rocks, such as shales and claystones, in a deep crustal setting. This type of granite is derived from sedimentary sources, resulting in an aluminium rich silica saturated magma that crystallised into granites containing minerals like muscovite, biotite, garnet and occasionally tourmaline or cordierite. The presence of volatiles such as water and fluorine in the late stages of granite crystallisation allows for the formation of pegmatitic pockets. Pegmatitic pockets within granite are small mineral rich zones found in coarse grained igneous rocks, particularly granites. These pockets form during the final stages of magma crystallisation when the magma chambers finally reach the point of near complete solidification from magma to rock. Volatile elements like water and fluorine become concentrated, lowering the magma's viscosity and allowing large, well formed crystals to grow. This slow cooling, mineral rich environment within the pockets provides ideal conditions for forming rare and high quality minerals such as topaz. The main topaz deposit is found in cavities within granitic pegmatite veins. These pegmatite veins, which can reach widths of over a metre, contain well-formed free-growing crystals of topaz along with quartz, shawl, beryl and feldspar, with some crystals measuring over a metre in size. Individual topaz crystals are often collected from eroded pegmatite pockets around the bay, where they occur alongside smoky quartz, large mica books and feldspar crystals. However, retrieving intact matrix specimens is challenging because topaz, which crystallizes late in the sequence, detaches from cavity walls due to the decomposition of surrounding feldspar and its own cleavage properties. In the case of topaz on Flinders Island, these pegmatitic pockets within the Devonian Killercranky granite intrusion, shown here, provided the necessary aluminium and fluorine rich conditions for topaz to crystallize. Over time, erosion exposed these pegmatitic pockets, releasing gem-quality topaz crystals into alluvial deposits where they could be collected. Most of the topaz recovered today is from recent alluvial and residual deposits, including some offshore areas. Richer alluvial deposits containing both cassiterite and abundant topaz are also located south of Tanner's Bay. To the north of Killacranky, blue beryl or aquamarine has been reported in some abundance. So this is the truth about diamonds on Flinders Island. They aren't really diamonds, but they definitely look like it. Even though they aren't real diamonds, they are a beautiful and fascinating variety of colourless topaz. With their brilliant clarity and diamond-like sparkle, these gems have captivated collectors and fossickers for centuries, adding a touch of mystery and allure to the island's rugged landscape. Today, fossickers are still allowed in the area to hunt for their own beautiful topaz specimens, and I definitely suggest giving it a go if you ever find yourself able to journey to this fascinating island. I hope you found this topic to be as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.